Jodie, thank you so much for joining me on the Pregnancy, Birth and Recovery podcast. Second second episode that we've done together and you're back. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. So as I mentioned in the intro, we recorded an amazing episode with Jodie's first um, first pregnancy and birth and full um, full disclosure, Jodie is a really dear friend of mine <laughs> and she's been a member of Fitness Mama for a few years now. Um, but Jodie's just um, just has has another story to share. So Jodie, you've just had beautiful twin boys four weeks ago. Mm-hmm. How's yeah. the ride been? Yeah, it's all a bit of a blur. I can't believe it's been four weeks. Um, yeah, so it'll be they'll be a month old tomorrow, actually. So um, yeah, crazy, crazy ride. Um, we sort of, well, we as you know, we had Harry almost three years ago now, and um, we thought, oh, will we go again? Will we not? Um, and we decided to to go again, and then we found out um, big surprise that we were having twins, identical twin boys. Uh, so it was all a bit of a shock. And then, um, yeah, we had a bit of a, a rough uh, start again to the pregnancy this time. Um, there was a bit of a growth difference in the twins initially. So um, that meant we sort of had a uh, a lot of monitoring and um, checks and, and scans and things throughout. Mm-hmm. But we've been so lucky again, touch wood. We've yeah. had, um, yeah, some healthy baby boys and, yeah, yeah. everyone's safe and well, so. Amazing. So let's let's rewind. Let's okay. take take it right back. Now, I the journey to becoming pregnant. Can you mm-hmm. talk us through when you were? Yeah, like did you come a time with Harry when he was a certain age that you just thought, "Yep, time to go again." Yeah, I think when he sort of um, was. Ready when he was about to turn two, I think was a time when you know people who have had um children similar ages were all sort of having their second, and it was about that time. You know, I was also looking ahead, I turned 40 in May, and I was thinking, oh, you know, I've got to kind of get a move on if I want to um, um, sort of do things before. In my head, I just had 40 in there as some sort of milestone that I wanted to hopefully fall pregnant before then. Um, so yeah, around that time, um, and then we started sort of trying and as you know, I had a a miscarriage last year at about seven weeks. So that was a bit of a hiccup and then, um, found out as part of that process that I had a fibroid in my uterus. So, um, the plan was I was going to have keyhole surgery to have that removed, um, and, two days before the surgery, I realized that I'd skipped a period. So I did a pregnancy test and lo and behold, I was pregnant. So we, we paused the surgery and, um, just, uh, crossed our fingers and toes, I guess that this pregnancy went, um, well, which it did. So yeah, it was a bit of a strange process. And why were you going to have that fibroid surgery at that stage? Was that impacting your chance of becoming pregnant? Yeah. So I went to an obstetrician here in Ballarat when I was, um, when I had the miscarriage. So when I was pregnant that time, I I went to the OB here. And then um, when we found out that I had the miscarriage, he did say, look, he would recommend getting the, um, the fibroid out. It was my choice, obviously, but he said, it it is probably hampering both my chance in falling pregnant and then also um keeping the baby if I did fall pregnant so we sort of given that I was turning 40 I didn't have a heap of I guess time on my side to just you know keep trying keep trying and, and see how you go the odds weren't strong that I would fall pregnant again and keep it but we decided we'd just um go with the surgery get it done, that would mean you'd sort of need, you know, four months or so where you'd need to stop trying. But we thought that was, um, you know, the best option for us. So, Mm. yeah. And I remember that being quite a big deliberation for you. Mm. It's like if we have this surgery, then it increases our chances of becoming pregnant, but we have to wait four months. Is that right? 
Exactly right. So they say, I think it was about after you had the surgery, you have to wait three months before you start trying again. And then obviously, you know, you're back to square one mm. in terms of you never know how long the process is going to take from there. So, um, yeah, it was a really big decision. Um, but we, we just thought, look, in the long run, I'm better to have the surgery and, um, yeah, see see how we go. And you were making all these decisions quite, was it quite soon after your miscarriage? Yes. Yeah. That was pretty much immediate. Yeah. As soon as that happened. Yeah. yeah. How were you feeling during that stage? Um, I was pretty devastated. Obviously, you know, heart goes out to anyone that goes through miscarriage, no matter what stage, you know, it was, yeah, it was a bit, um, I, I was personally devastated, but, um, I knew that I needed to, you know, get back on the horse, so to speak, and try to do something to give myself the best chance to fall pregnant again. So I was pretty mm. keen to, to yep. get things moving. So talk us through two days before you're due to go in for the surgery for the fibroid. Yes. And you just suddenly think, I might be pregnant. Is that what happened? Yeah, yeah pretty much. I just thought, oh, I'll just do a pregnancy test just in case. I was all ready to go into surgery. Um, and then when I actually saw that the test was positive, I was um, actually really worried. Like I was really stressed because I thought, oh, gosh, I knew that the chances of me keeping the baby weren't high. So I rang the obstetrician and said, you wouldn't believe it. Um, I've just done a pregnancy test and, and it's positive. And I was really worried. I said, oh, oh, no, I don't know what to do. And he said, this is great. Don't worry about it. Just let it go. Um, you know, we just hope that like half the battle was falling pregnant. That's now happened. So excellent news. Let's just, um, you know, go with the process and trust in it and, just try not to stress yourself out and hopefully all will go well and thankfully it all did in the end. Okay, so that was two days before the surgery was booked and then how long did it take for you to find out that you were pregnant with twins? Oh, yes. Uh, so the first um, the first scan I had um, was actually, so I had that obstetrician, it was pretty early on, I can't remember, it was under six weeks um, and uh the obstetrician actually said there's only one baby all healthy everything's fine so we thought there was only one initially um and then I think it was around the six week uh no maybe that one was six weeks and then I think at 10 weeks I had a bleed again out with Kath actually and another girlfriend for for breakfast in Melbourne and um, I had had some bleeding with Harry, my, my firstborn, um, which turned out fine. But then I also had bleeding before my miscarriage. And then this time again at 10 weeks I had a, a bleed and I was devastated. I definitely thought that I'd lost the baby. Um, so I was due to have a, a checkup with the obstetrician, I think the following day anyway. So I actually went in. That was a pretty rough 24 hours. I thought, mm. you know back to the drawing board, um, but went into the obstetrician for that 10-week scan, pretty much thinking, okay, this is, um, you know, there's there's no baby there anymore. Um, and then I didn't actually have my husband with me for that scan, so I was solo. And at that scan, um, the obstetrician said, look, everything's fine, which is great. And he was really embarrassed because he realised there was actually two babies in there. Um, so that was a really big shock. <laughs> And why was he embarrassed? Can... I think he was, he's, he was a lovely guy, um, this obstetrician. Um, he ended up deferring me to a different one, which is another story. But, um, yeah, he, I think, was just embarrassed that he told me at that first scan that there was only one baby. So, um, yeah, and he knew our backstory having gone through, you know, the the fibroid situation and the miscarriage. So I think he thought, oh, two is going to be a bit of a handful. <laughs> But, um, yeah, I think he's just embarrassed that he missed it the first time. Mm. So you were by yourself. You yes. get told you don't yeah. have one baby. You've got two babies. You thought you were about to be told you're having a miscarriage yes. and find out you got two babies. Yeah. Talk us through what were you, what was happening in your brain. I was just in a complete world of shock. Obviously I was happy that there I, I hadn't had a miscarriage, so um, that was a bit of relief. But then 
absolute shock. And for some reason, I like to think about what my partner would think. Um, <laughs> so I was uh, pretty keen to get home and, and tell him, but um, yeah, I was just the whole way, the whole drive home. I was thinking, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I don't know how we're going to do this. Um, and then, yeah, when I got home, I said, you know, sit down to my husband and um, get ready for some news. And I've, I think he was bracing like me for the fact that, you know, we had another miscarriage and he couldn't believe it. And his first comments were, we need a bigger car <laughs> to carry <laughs> everyone around. He was just thinking logistics. But, um, yeah, we were both in a bit of shock thinking, how on earth are we going to manage this? And when you were thinking, how are we going to manage this, what in particular were you, were you thinking about one particular thing that in hindsight sounds ridiculous, but was there one? Um, I think it's just, you know, when you have a baby and everything's a blur for the first, you know, few months and you just have little flashbacks. I remember a few nights where I couldn't settle Harry and it was, you're just at your wits end, you know, you've checked everything, it's not settling and in the middle of the night you're really frustrated and I would have flashbacks to those moments and think that was hard enough with one. Imagine that with two and the other baby screaming, like, how am I going to cope in that situation? How's my husband going to cope if it's him alone in that situation? Just, yeah, just thinking about those moments that were stressful with Harry and then thinking, oh, my gosh, multiply that by two. Um, Yeah, that was probably the biggest sort of alarm bell going off in my head. Yeah. So Grant's worried about the car. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah logistics yep did it take long for you to like share the news with your family and like or did you uh, need processing time no we actually as it happened the following day um we from when we found out I think we found out on a yeah it was a Friday Friday I think and then the following day we had a family friend's wedding so um we actually told my parents and brother um at the wedding and we thought we better jump on the phone to Grant's parents and tell them as well because they'd been they'd been very we're very close to both families and they'd been here supporting throughout the whole process when I'd had the miscarriage and then um they were sort of aware of what was going on so we told them that we were pregnant early on um but the update was yeah that all of a sudden there's there's now going to be two babies so they're all as shocked as we were yeah so how is pregnancy different with a twin pregnancy? Um, to be honest, the first part of it wasn't that different for me. I was so lucky that I didn't actually get sick. I didn't get any morning sickness or anything like that, which I didn't get with Harry either. So that was pretty similar for me. Um, it was only the fact at 20 weeks that um, the obstetrician that I was seeing um, rang and said, with the scans because I was having more regular scans. That was the the big difference at that point. He said one of the scans had turned up a bit of a growth difference in the twins and it was high enough that he was concerned that there could be a bit of twin-to-twin transfusion happening. Um, so that's when sort of um, he said, I think you're better to be seeing this specialist obstetrician in Melbourne um, and they'll be able to take care of you um, better than we can. You'll have more weekly scans, more possibly even more regular than that towards the end. Um, and you can have the baby where there's, you know, all well, the babies, sorry, where there's a NICU and special care sort of ready, which might not have been the case down here in Ballarat. So, um, yeah, it, in terms of physically probably not much difference. It was just knowing that that, um, you know, more regular um, scans and um, check-ins and and so forth. Can you talk us through that growth difference you mentioned? What would have happened if there'd been a big difference in the baby sizes? Yeah, so as far as I understood it, um, the way it was explained to me, at that point in time at 20 weeks, there was a 19% growth difference in, in my twins. So, um, yeah, the the little one um, was about 19% behind in growth. But um, that's when the way the obstetricians both explain that to me is that anything over 20% is classed as this twin-to-twin transfusion syndrome, and that's when they're concerned about the, the outcome um, of the pregnancy. So 
um, there was sort of there's three different types of twin to twin transfusion syndrome and they can sort of tell which one you have depending on the growth difference but also the way the blood was flowing um, through the umbilical cord so that was what they were checking very regularly but I was very lucky that um, even though there was that initial growth difference there was like the blood was flowing in the positive way that it should have been um, so things were looking better than they um, could have been in that scenario. And then as it happened from 20 weeks through to when I had them at 36 weeks, um, the little twin actually caught up in growth. So by the end, he, there was only about 3% difference. Um, and it did fluctuate every week. Those weekly check-ins where I was going to Melbourne for the scans, it was kind of like oh, what are we going to have today? And sometimes it was closer to, you know, up towards 20 and other days it was down towards 10. So, yeah, it did fluctuate a bit, but that's that's what we were checking every week. Mm. That would have been, well, from what I imagine, that would have been a bit stressful, was it? Yeah, it was stressful, Just think, particularly those days when you just think, um, gosh, where like you, you hear that it might be on the higher side, that, you know, that, that, the days it was 19%. And initially when it was like, okay, here's the call, you've got to go to Melbourne, you've got to be transferred to this obstetrician. They'll, she's really busy, but she's cleared her books to see you because you're thinking, oh gosh, this this sounds serious. This um mm. doesn't sound good. But um, and I'm very aware for a lot of um, you know, this obstetrician that I that I went to, um, Innie, she's amazing at some instance, but she had a lot of similar patients, but they aren't so lucky that their um, their journey's the other way. You know, they don't start with a big growth difference, and then potentially towards mm. the end, that that's the syndrome is, um, yeah, greater than it was at the start. But I, um, you know, had a really lucky case where mine went the, the right way. So, um, yeah, I was just it was just a watch and see. But I was. I was very positive from her weekly scans that things were going the right way and she was sort of instilling that in me, look, you know, this is a much better scenario than when you initially came to us, so things are travelling in the right direction. Let's just hope they stay the same. Yeah, brilliant. So you're, let's let's take you to around 30 weeks pregnancy, like yeah. in the last trimester. Yeah. What did you feel like your choices were when it came to birth? Like did they... Was it at this stage they talk, started talking you through the options available for you? Yeah, that's actually probably the biggest um, surprise that I had along the way. I just assumed, and when I was seeing the original obstetrician in Ballarat here, we both just assumed, my husband and I, that we would have to have a cesarean birth with twins. That was just, I, you know, I thought par for the course. Um, and certainly um, down here in Ballarat, I think that's the direction that things would have gone. Um, but when I went to see the obstetrician in Melbourne and things started, you know, towards that 30 week mark, things were looking positive in terms of not as big a growth difference as we thought. Um, I was tracking along pretty well in terms of my health and everything else was on track. So I'd already had a vaginal birth with Harry, um, and the obstetrician in, he said to me, look, um, you're a really good candidate for a vaginal birth for these twins. And I was quite shocked thinking, oh, I just had my head around that it would be a Caesar. Um, and she said, well, it doesn't have to be. So, um, yeah, I was a bit, as you know, Kath, I was a bit nervous about that because I had just, I don't know, for some reason in my head thought, I, you know, I'm not going to have a vaginal birth again. So, um, yeah, I, I just needed to get my head around it more than anything. Um, and then as we got closer to, um, yeah, once we ticked over the 32-week mark, um, yeah, we'd, we'd booked in for, for a vaginal birth induction. Um, and that's that's how we went. <laughs> so talk us through what you were thinking because no doubt, like, were you thinking about the pros and cons of each? Like, how did you come to yeah. your conclusion? Yeah. Um, so I, I think the biggest thing for me, um, because the, the birth that I had with Harry was quite smooth. Like I was pretty lucky I had a, had a pretty smooth birth with him. Um, but I, in my head, I was just thinking, oh, I haven't prepared for this one as much. You know, I am a bit older. I haven't been exercising as much as I was with my first born, you know, am I going to be physically as strong 
there's two babies, like am I going to be pushing for twice as long and this is going to be twice as taxing on me physically? Um, that was what I was trying to get my head around, I guess. Um, but then also was thinking with Harry because he was in special care for, um, you know, he was in the Royal Children's for three weeks. So I did need to be up and on my feet and it helped not having to, um, not having had gone through the cesarean recovery, I literally just jumped onto my feet after the birth and, and went down to be by his bedside. And I thought, I don't know what's going to happen here with the twins, how long they might need to be in a special care nursery. So it would be great to be as, um, you know, as mobile as I could be, I guess, um, after this birth to try and, um, you know, handle everything that was coming afterwards. And so that was that was probably your biggest, was that the biggest point with your decision-making? That Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I think also, I mean, I was pretty easygoing in terms of I was happy to take in his direction. She was the professional. She, you know, had seen this and she was very um, adamant that I um, – was a really good candidate for a vaginal birth with this with the twins. Yeah. So I trusted in her and thought, yeah. you know what, I can do this. I would like to be, um, you know, as mobile as I can be afterwards. So just trust in her and, and go with it. Yeah. And talk us through the indu- induction side of it. Is that something she recommended or did you have any options around there? That yeah. yeah. Um, no, any recommended it. Um, she said once we get to 30 sort of, six weeks that was um when they usually um uh induce twins um and I think when I had the final scan um they were actually because they were only three percent difference um the the guy that was doing the scan said oh you could actually probably go a bit longer or your obstetrician might give you the option to go another week but you know, having said that I was fine, physically fine all pregnancy, those last couple of weeks they were full on trying to carry the twins. You know, it was very heavy. I could feel, um, you know, low, low kicking. Um, it was sort of it wasn't comfortable at all. Uh, I was getting lots of indigestion and just was finding it hard to sleep. I did have a bit of a cold those last couple of weeks as well. So it was all just... You know, it was a bit um, taxing those last few weeks and I thought, no, I think I'm ready to, if they're healthy at 36 weeks, then, yeah, let's let's go now because, um, yeah, my body was, <laughs> was definitely over carrying them. Yeah. Talk us through the morning of the induction. Yeah, gosh. Well, for starters, that last few days, I just remember thinking, oh, gosh, just hang in there, please hang in there. Like I just wanted to make it to the induction day. Um, because I knew that Innie had it all planned out. Everyone's going to be in the room at that time. It's all going to be hopefully according to plan. Um, so, yeah, we were asked to come in at um, 6.30 in the morning. Um, I didn't have to go in the night before because when I had a vaginal exam um, on the Friday, so I was booked to be induced on the Monday, had a vaginal exam on the Friday and I was already three centimetres dilated. Um, so I didn't need to go in and have any gel or anything like that. Um, so they said, come back on Monday morning at 6.30, ready to go. Um, so did that, went into the delivery suite and they pretty much gave me, um, first thing was get ready and have the early epidural, um, which I did and, um, that all went well. And then, um, was that the first thing you had when you went in there? Yeah, yeah, right. I think so. I think it was between that and the, um, yeah, I think that was the, the first thing. <laughs> and then it was, yeah, hooked up to the oxytocin and um, get things moving, yeah. And talk us through that epidural. Was that another choice? Like had you consciously th- wanted that as part of your pl- plan? Um, I did want that as part of my plan but because uh, I did have one with Harry. Um but I do think that it would have been decided for me anyway because um, with my twins, so the twin A, the bigger one, was down low, head first, he was ready to go. But twin B, up until um, the induction day, he was actually feet down. So they said um, 
any the obstetrician would basically have to reach up and pull him down by the feet once the the first twin was out and that's why they were giving me the the epidural because they 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 needed it for for that process um so yeah I wasn't looking forward to that part um but as it happened um we didn't need to do that because once twin A came out twin B did a little somersault into the the space and he came out head first too Oh, amazing! So, <laughs> so you so you went in at six thirty. Yeah. What time did you have the epidural? What happened after that? Good question. I wish I'd paid more attention to the the timings, but I think it was a, a couple of hours probably by the time we sort of set things up and and ready to go. Um, probably around eight thirty, I imagine it was. And then, um, yeah, we just had uh, yeah hooked up to the oxytocin, and then I think. Um, We'd planned on any said if you could have these babies around sort of 1.30, that'd be amazing around lunchtime. Why? <laughs> so, uh, I don't know. It must have fitted in with her schedule, but um, <laughs> that was sort of the joke that that was the plan. Um, but then, yeah, uh, it was sort of a bit of a blur. I just remember being quite sleepy actually, which was bizarre, um, just sort of, yeah, I was quite calm um, and I, I don't know whether it was I don't know what was happening with you know the the drip and what it was the effect it had on me but I, I just remember being quite sleepy um and then yeah once so they broke the waters and I think officially they said my labor for the first twin came was an hour and a half um so it wasn't long at all um and yeah it was pretty smooth actually and were you can fine to the bed yes I was yeah yeah I did have the um a lot of the the monitoring on me and then they had um put a little um uh what do you call it tape on Lenny's head on the first mm-hmm. twin's head so um just to to monitor him so um they'd put that that cap on his head as well so they could tell what was happening and had to sort of stay on the bed yeah. Was that more mon- monitoring than you'd had with Harry? Um, other than the the cap on the the bigger twin's head, I think, yeah, everything would have been the same. Yeah. 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 Because they also wanted to Harry um, monitor Harry too. So for those listening, Harry had a, correct me if I'm wrong, Jodie, but a congenital diaphragmatic hernia. So they exactly. needed to get him off to theatre pretty quickly. So. Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So you were lying down. You're feeling sleepy. Did you feel yeah. an urge to push? With yeah. So pain? I felt. Um. I actually felt no pain. Um. It was a lot of pressure, but I wouldn't say pain. Um. So that was that was great. Um. And then I did start to feel. I didn't actually st- feel the urge to push. It was probably um, just before um that before about midday I think it was um one of the midwives um had she was she was constantly checking obviously the the twin who had the little um cap on their on on their scalp and um his blood pressure actually started to get a little bit high so she called the obstetrician and um to come in and do a vaginal exam um and uh they did that and that's when the obstetrician pretty quickly said um look, you're fully dilated actually, so let's just start pushing now. Um, so that all happened really quickly. My partner was actually going out to get some fresh air and a sandwich, so he nearly missed it. Um, but, yeah, that pretty much just said, quick, call your husband and shove the phone in my um, in my face and I said, you better get back here quick. And then they said, right, start pushing. And as soon as I hung up the phone, he walked in and I was pushing, so he was like, what's going on? Oh my gosh! Um, did, so, Jody, did you have any gel or syntocin or anything like that? So they just broke your waters. Yeah, so they broke the waters early on. Yeah, I didn't have gel. Um, I just had the dri- the oxytocin. Through the oh, drip. you did have the oxytocin. Yeah, yeah. okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so did they had to coach you with the pushing? They they were telling you when to push, or could you feel it at that yes, stage? Yes, no. Um, they told me. They said when there's a contraction at the end. Well, basically when you start feeling the tightening, because I could definitely feel the tightening and the pressure, I said at the start of the next contraction, we feel that tightening, you know, big breath in and then push. Um, and 
it all came back to me sort of having been through with Harry, you know, okay, yep, pushing. And um, I think I spent a lot of time pushing with Harry, but nowhere near as long this time. Um, so it was it was pretty quick. It was actually only a few pushes and the first twin was, was out. Um, and then, uh, yeah, they popped him up on my chest and I was just, you know, crying, looking at this little guy on my chest here. And um, meanwhile, a couple more pushes and the second little guy came out. So you were pushing with a baby on your chest. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Yeah, and there was actually, um, so the they had planned to have um, a second obstetrician in the room, which I think is is normal procedure with twins as I understand it, but um, he didn't actually make it in because it all happened so quickly. He didn't even make it in time for the first twin um, to to pop out. So he sort of entered the room. There was a lot of people in the room and, and he sort of entered halfway between and there was only five minutes between the twins. So it was all, um, yeah, a bit rushed, but, um, yeah, smooth. Now I think we forgot to mention at the start, identical. Yes, yeah, sorry, yeah. Identical. Twin boys. Yep, so identical one placenta but separate sacs, so identical, yep, and boys. Amazing. So you've got these two identical babies on your yes. chest. Yes, although they didn't look very identical when they came out. They um, uh, So the bigger one had very pale a very pale complexion and the smaller one had a very red complexion. So um, the medical team think that there probably was a bit of transfusion that happened either during the labour or really late in that pregnancy where um, the distribution of oxygen wasn't wasn't quite equal. Um, but the, the twins didn't have to go to special care or anything like that and they... Um, yeah, they they were they ha- both had a touch of jaundice, but the pediatrician um, was confident that they're sort of that would even out over time, and there was sort of not too much to worry about in terms of one being really pale and one being really red. So, mm. yeah, they didn't. They still don't to me look that identical, but they are. <laughs> How did you feel when you had two babies on your chest at that? Just yeah, after that? Uh, just just uh, surreal so surreal um yeah just immediately that sense of um you know I can't believe that here they're 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 out they're here um amazed but yeah just crazy and just crazy how that whole process you think how have I carried these little guys around for nine months it's just amazing what the human body can do so yeah it was all a bit surreal and how was what was Grant doing at this stage uh he I think he was thinking the same thing it was kind of like an out-of-body experience that looking at these two little kids and little bubbers and going wow that they're ours now <laughs> two more little um munchkins to look after but yeah um yeah he was he was just in a state of shock I think as well and did uh, talk us through did they um like after that at what stage did you start to try feeding them yeah so um there was so immediately I mean I was a bit distracted because I had always at least one twin like they were taking one and doing their checks while I had the other and swapping over so that was good because it was sort of a distraction I was sort of unaware of what else was going on to my body but um that was probably the only bit that was um painful in some description the uh, midwives were trying to uh, massage like my my stomach and it was quite tender at that point there was quite a bit of pressure and I think that was probably partly due to the fibroid which had um with the blood flow had expanded so it did feel like a bit of a tennis ball um for a while for a couple of days um so yeah they were trying to massage that sort of straight after the birth while I was distracted um but yeah that was that was the only thing that um we sort of that happened in the delivery room once all the the twins were checked and um yeah we, it was sort of very calm from that point they just went to the little cribs and um uh yeah I went and had my shower and then we sort of waited for our 
for our room and off we went. So it was all very different to when I had Harry and mm. he scooted straight off and um, the room was empty. But, um, yeah, it was all very orderly. <laughs> So the first breastfeed with them, was it both at the same time or one at a time? Um, try to th- I don't actually remember trying to breastfeed in that delivery suite. I mm-hmm. think it was, um, it actually wasn't for a little while. I think it was probably later that night when we got back to our room um, that the nurses said, you know, would you like to try and um, help get them on the breast? Um, I did have one of the amazing twin Z pillows handed down to me from a twin mum friend. Um, so I tried to sort of, um, you know, sit on the bed and do, and tandem feed them, but that was a bit tricky. Initially the advice I had from the medical team was try and um, just do one at a time to get the mas- master that first before you try and, you know, tandem feed both, which can be a bit tricky to get them to um to latch on properly so um yeah I think we just tried to do you know one at a one at a time from there and um to be honest we had mixed results one the smaller twin was actually really strong and and pretty um he was okay at the breast but the the bigger one he didn't really show a lot of interest so um yeah I had to wait probably I think it was about three days till my milk came in anyway so um yeah we just we started um giving them formula from then and we're doing a bit of mixed at the moment I'm pumping a lot and trying to give them a mixture of express breast milk and formula so talk us uh, and I do want to go back to those early days but talk us through that how do you like I know with one to breastfeed change nappies pop them to sleep, yeah. express, like that takes long enough. How do you, how does the day look with yeah. two sets of breastfeeding and expressing and feeding? Yeah, and yeah. Um, we're still trying to work that out, to be honest. Um, I'm sure it will change a few times, but we've been lucky. My um, husband's been on paternity leave. He actually goes back to work this week, but he's been working sort of two days a week and then I've had, um, either my parents or his parents here to support during those couple of days at least. So I've always kind of had a second pair of hands around apart from, you know, a couple of days here and there. So that's been a huge help because I have been able to kind of pass someone one twin in a bottle while I do the second twin either at the same time and then I can sort of pump at the same time as feeding one or I can pump after when I've sort of settled them down. Um, but, yeah, at the mo- we started initially trying to keep them on the same schedule So we heard that that was the way to go because as soon as they're out of sync, then we spend all day, you know, feeding and um, trying to keep up with, with each of them on different schedules. But the last couple of days we've actually just let them sort of dictate their own terms and not necessarily wake up the second one when the first one wakes up for a feed. Um, and that's been okay when there's two people because you can basically just tag one baby each and it means, you know, my twin the other night when I was, I had the smaller twin and he actually slept through eight hours. So I picked the winner there and my husband was <laughs> over three hours with the other one. And then we swapped and then again yeah. slept for six hours. So perfect. Um, <laughs> But, yeah, yeah that's, that's been – we're trialling that at the moment. But yeah. there we go. And can you talk us through, like, at what stage did you decide – like, was it a given from the start that you would introduce formula, like, right from the start? Or what was the process behind that? Can you just talk us through your yep. – yeah, what was go, what was happening there? Yeah. So, originally, because with Harry I, I had trouble getting him on the breast and I ended up um, expressing – for 11 months and he had mixed with formula but probably mostly um express breast milk um and I pumped for 11 months and everyone had said to me how on earth did you do that that's really taxing on you and it was but I just sort of I didn't know any difference so I just it was it was fine for me um but I thought oh I don't think I'd be able to do that with twins I think I won't like I'll have a toddler as well around you know what if I I'm trying to feed two babies pump and take care of the toddler I just can't see that happening 
Um, so I had hoped that they, that both twins would just um, breastfeed and then I'd be able to, to do that while I was sort of, you know, maybe either tandem down the track or, you know, trying one-on-one while my husband was still here um, on leave, able to help. Um, but I think I just, uh, that initially when my milk hadn't come in yet, they obviously had to be fed. So it was, it was formula and that was fine. That, that was sort of the only option. Um, and then as my milk came in, I was trying them on the breast with the help of the midwives in hospital, but I was finding that it was so hard to tell how much they were getting, um, I was giving them a fair bit of time on the breast. They were sort of on and off, on and off, but then they'd still drink a whole bottle of formula anyway. So I didn't think they're actually getting that much from me. So, you know, to get them fed and particularly when they wake up, you know, screaming and hungry, it was just give them the bottle straight away quick, like just give them some some sort of milk. Um, so I found at the moment, I did see a lactation consultant a couple of weeks ago and she suggested um, trying the nipple shields because they're obviously fine with the bottle and that definitely makes a difference I think especially with the little one Ted he um, he's quite good with the nipple shield um, I just need to try and get him on the breast a bit more give him more opportunities I guess um, at the moment to in between all the expressing and bottle feeds just to try and keep up my supply and Hopefully breastfeeding will be an option if at some point, you know, we just need to try and feed him. Mm. So, yes. what was, <laughs> oh, it's, yeah, it's just a full-time job, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and how, what was the weight difference like between the babies when they're born? Yeah, so actually pretty good. Um, so Lenny was 2.6 kilos and Ted was 2.4. Yeah. So, yeah, and only 200 grams or so. And I have to ask before I forget, how was the recovery on your body, like in terms of any perineal tears? Like yeah. how, how do you feel your yeah body's gone? Yeah, um, amazingly well. I can't believe it actually. I only had a graze. Um, I didn't have any tears or anything too major. So, um, yeah, I've just been so lucky. I can't believe it. I think you know, they're both being um, smaller, I guess, than, than say, Harry was, um, even though there was two of them probably helped with that. But, uh, yeah, I had I've so far had a pretty straightforward recovery. Yeah, fantastic. So life with two uh, yeah. with twins, how's yeah. Harry coped? How has Harry found the introduction of twins into his life? Yeah, amazingly well. Um, I can't, that's another thing I've been um, taken aback by is, well, firstly, overnight how much he's grown when you have new babies. You just come to <laughs> hospital, don't you, and go, oh, my gosh, you're a teenager. Um, but he had a little holiday with Nanny and Pa for the yeah, first week or so when we were in hospital, and then um, he's been entertained sort of ever since with grandparents and his um his uh, half sister Layla as well, keeping him very busy. Um, but he's been amazing. I was worried about him, and you do feel. I know a lot of people warned me about this um, leading in, but you feel guilty for not spending the time with your toddler when you've got these newborn babies, and especially when there's two. Uh, you know, all, so much of my time is spent on these babies. I'm really conscious of Harry and trying to devote time to him as well um but he's been amazing he's very independent he's you know look like takes care of um himself keeps himself entertained and then he's been really caring and loving towards the babies which has been Mm. so great give us just a couple of examples what have what do you think's helped with harry like have there been any little tips or tricks that you've done with harry that you think have been helpful? Yeah, I'm not sure there's anything. I I've, I think um, I'm not sure if it's anything we've done or he, he's just, I don't know, He's he's been amazing. But I think it has helped that there has been people around him um, to keep him busy. And yeah. I know that, um, 
you know, my parents, Grant's parents, um, Layla, they've all been consistently around for Harry. So he probably hasn't, like he's, he's, he hasn't felt that he's missing us because he's just so busy and entertained, which has been amazing. That's the the best thing. And even the neighbours, you know, are so great. Like, oh, does Harry want to come over for a little play for a couple of hours and mm. just keep him busy so that he's not sort of sitting around going, oh, mum and dad are always busy with the babies. Um, yeah. we, we do when we're at home, you know, we try and keep things relatively um, consistent with him for his routine. You know, he's been going to daycare um, back um, as he would have been and um he we try and include him in things as well you know he'll when he hears the twins crying like he'll go over and say it's okay Harry's right here and he'll get them a little oh. blanket and he feels involved in taking yeah it. yeah oh beautiful so four weeks yeah I'm amazed that you can even chat today I thought I was pushing things a little bit, asking uh, you to get God for grandparents, eh? <laughs> um, Is there anything else you would like to tell listeners? Like what you, you've you been through a crazy journey and I'm sure life with twins, for any twin mums that are pregnant at the moment listening, like is there anything that, yeah, anything you want to share, Jodes, to finish off? Yeah, I think um, the biggest um, learning experience for me was probably around that vaginal delivery versus cesarean. Like I know everyone's case is completely different, but um, I was quite shocked when the obstetrician had suggested that a vaginal birth was possible for me and that was sort of what she was um, leaning towards. Um, So I guess all I'd say is I know there's certain hospitals that – a, a lot more open to, to that than um, for multiple births than, than others. And I think that's why I did actually have um, a transfer in hospitals once I got to that 32-week mark um, because of the fact that they were planning a vaginal birth for me and, and my obstetrician knew that this hospital would be, you know, a, a bit more um, supportive of that. Um, but I guess I would just say, you know, if it's possible, like don't be scared by that. Don't be, I know it's really daunting and it's easy for me to say on this side of it because I was I was pretty daunted by the, the prospect of a vaginal birth for twins um, as well. But, um, you know, for me, like it, it couldn't have gone more smoothly and um, I'm really glad that I went down that path now um, and trusted in the, the process that my body would know what to do. So, yeah, that's I guess, yeah, try not to be daunted by that if it's an option for you. Yeah, great. And at the start, one of the first things you said when you found out you were pregnant, you mentioned you were thinking, how am I going to cope with twins? Yeah. So, Jody, how are you coping with twins? <laughs> uh, well, so far it's uh, one day at a time and, um, you know, from one three-hour increment to the next and we just get through. But, yeah. Um, you know, I, I do, I feel like at the moment, you know, we're lucky we've got lots of help and lots of great support. And also for us knowing that it's this, these are our last babies. So, um, you know, we've decided we, we're not having any more, but um, just to remind ourselves, you know, when it's really tough and you feel like this is never ending and we're just reminding ourselves, we'll never, you know, my husband says, we'll never hold another Mm. baby of ours this small ever again so just try and you know Mm. enjoy the moment as rough it is as it might be at the time but yeah for us I think that helps knowing that you know this this isn't going to happen again for us so you know try and take it all in um and then I'm sure as the you know I'm very aware that they're still so young and once they, you know, get a bit older and they've got more awake time, I'm sure things will get rougher again and, um, you know, there'll be lots of ups and downs. But I think just taking it a day at a time and, yeah, reminding yourself that it is, it goes so fast. So yeah. try to enjoy it. I, like so many women I speak to, and I know I felt the same, when they know it's their last baby, it really does change the mindset of it all, doesn't it? Yeah. Compared to yeah. your first where, yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah. And I think also because you know, you know, everyone says it goes so quickly, but with your first you're there and you're in the moment and it's it does seem to be a rough ride. 
um, then all of a sudden, you know, you're 12 months down the track and you look back and you're like, God, that went quick. And so now mm. second and third, it's like, no, this really will, that you'll blink and you'll miss it. So yeah. you just try and embrace it for, for now. And I find still with my third, you sort of every new stage, you sort of mourn the old yeah, stage. Yeah. Like every time yeah. I go up a size in a onesie, yeah. or, you know, yeah. as mine started prep, like it doesn't matter. Like you still sort of mourn. This is the last time this will happen. Yeah. Um, have you had, final question, have you, I'm just interested to know, have you, because you've had so much beautiful support from your family and neighbours and um, you know, everyone around you, have you had to do a night by yourself yet? Like put all three to bed solo? Not yet. Not a night. No. A pretty a couple of days home from hospital. My husband realized that he had to be in um, Melbourne for for a half day, sort of in the morning, and um, that uh, yeah, that caught me by surprise because he forgot he well, caught us both by surprise because he'd forgotten he'd booked this appointment. But um, I'd had like a day, um, you know, sort of by myself with the toddler, the twins, and that was kind of a anxious, um, you know, thought, how am I going to do this by myself? But it was actually fine. My toddler was amazing. You know, he might have watched more TV that day than he would have otherwise, but, hey, it, he was happy. He was fed. The twins were fed. Uh, it was all good, you know. Things were yeah. okay. So I haven't had to do a night yet. Um, that'll be, yeah, that'll be interesting. And also knowing this week my husband's back at work, um, that'll be an interesting time as well, even though like he's working from home, but I'm also conscious that, you know, I can't just call on him. Like I, I need to let him sort of do his work, but it also is comforting to know that he's only just in the office if things, you know, I really yeah. just need him for a minute or two. I think what you said before is very relevant. Like often it's our thoughts that are worse than actual. Yeah. Like worrying about what <laughs> might be coming up is worse than actual yeah. doing. Um, and I love what you said about you just focusing on three-hour increments at a time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The baby steps, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Jodie, for sharing your beautiful story with little well, Lenny yeah. and Ted. <laughs> nice to speak with you. Absolutely. Um, yes, thank you for taking time out and we'll chat to you soon. Sounds good. Thanks, Kath. Okay, bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Fitness Mama podcast brought to you by the Fitness Mama freebies found at www.fitnessmama.com forward slash free. So please take a few seconds to leave a review, subscribe so you don't miss an episode and be sure to take a screenshot of this podcast, upload it to your social media and tag me at Fitness Mama so I can give you a shout out too. Until next time, remember an active pregnancy, confident childbirth and strong postnatal recovery is something that you deserve. Remember our disclaimer, materials and contents in this podcast are intended as general information only and shouldn't substitute any medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. I'll see you soon.